And I just wanted to open this up in a good way with good energy and a little bit of a reminder um, from where these lands, where you're, where you're at and in terms of whose lands we are residing on and living on and as guests. I want to acknowledge all of the ancestors that have come before us from the Ute tribes, the Cheyenne tribes, and the Arapaho tribes, all of the tribes that passed through this way um, for migration, trading, and acknowledge that the territories of these ancestors and that these are still indigenous lands by Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868. If you don't know about that treaty, please look it up, do some research. But these ancestors took care of these lands so that we could be here today and have clean water and have clean air. And now it's changing. But we need to be reminded that the seven generations ago thought about us and we need to continue that responsibility. It is our responsibility to do that, not just the people who are from here, but everybody. Because um, climate change is here. We have to work with Mother Earth. We have to move forward with Mother Earth because we can't overpower Mother Earth. And now Mother Earth is doing what she has to do to restore the balance. So we have to work with her. My Hopi people have um, prophesied that things have been happening for the last few hundred years and the land's been changing. And even my grandfather tracked the weather. He tracked things that were taking place, new insects that were coming and evolving. And so we knew this was happening. And our songs and our stories help keep that balance. Our ceremonies help keep that balance. But we can't do this anymore. It's, it's overpowering us. And once we're overpowered, we won't have our language. So we're really trying to keep things in, in balance for everybody, for all living things. But all of the nations together are trying to unite to help Mother Earth. And I just wanted to say, for all of you out there who are becoming earth warriors, earth caretakers, water protectors, land defenders, I thank you. Um, from all of the, the territories in this region and say keep up the good work and get your hands in the soil because our genetic memory will wake up once your hands are in the soil. Healthy soil wakes up your nervous system. So as an indigenous permaculturist and 12 seed generation seed keeper, um, this is something that you should be doing and helping Mother Earth to flourish all different types of vegetation. So I just want to say a prayer for good energy to share our knowledge, to share our wisdom for all of you, and again, acknowledge the ancestors that were here before us and all the future generations, seven generations to come, and all the babies who are unborn yet. So. This is something that is very critical, is very needed, and powerful energy that we can move together, we can mobilize, and we can work with Mother Earth for all living things, not just humanity, not just humans, but all living things, because it's more important for Mother Earth to exist um, right now. And that's our responsibility as indigenous people, is to take care of the Earth and to take care of the people and to take care of all living things, so we can't have Creator, we thank you for allowing us to be here, to share the knowledge and wisdom, to come together with good energy and good intentions. We come to you with humility. We come to you with requests of more knowledge and more wisdom, more skills, more tools, more resources that we may be able to help Mother Earth and we may be, may be able to Keep the living things on the earth and help support all of our ecosystems. Protect the water, protect the soil, protect the land, and bring our knowledge together to unite all of us as one people. We are all indigenous peoples from different areas. We all have that genetic memory. May we use it in good, um, with good intentions. May we acknowledge all of the ancestors who were here before us. May we acknowledge all of the um, generations, seven generations to come. And allow us to 
give us the strength, give us the power, and teach these skills and wisdom with the next seven generations and pass on that. It is critical. Right now, we have um, things that are happening in the world, lots of injustices. May we pull together to be able to do something about those injustices and stop watching them as they happen. And may we educate and share all of our knowledge with all of the young people younger than us and the ones to come. Please give all of us strength today to share that wisdom and that knowledge and to interact and to give all of our youth voices for the land and for the people and for all living things. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Shannon, so much for that. So as a Mexican immigrant uh, and someone that has been in the movement for social justice and racial justice for over 12 years, I know now more than ever how much is at stake right now. Uh, we have so much more to lose, but also we have so much more that we could potentially gain if we actually work together. So my vision for Colorado is a vision in which everyone is welcomed regardless of where they come from and their status. My vision for the state is one in which the economy works for all of us, in which the economy benefits workers, not just corporations and the wealthy few. It is also one in which we all have access to clean air and clean water, one in which we work to put people and planet first. But I am clear that I cannot win that on my own. My organization cannot win and achieve that vision on its own. So that's why I'm really excited to be here today because the groups that have been putting this event together uh, are from different sectors that have come together to fight for a just and equitable transition to a renewable energy economy that will not leave workers behind, that will put frontline communities in the front as well. So I wanna give a shout out to the groups that have been doing this work, that took a step to actually do something different and work with each other. So I'm just gonna read them out, and if you hear them, just say woo or something, okay? So they, they feel the love a little bit. Um, so 350 Colorado, <laughs> Clean Energy Action. Colorado AFL-CIO, Conservation Colorado, Protegete, Denver Area Labor Federation, Defend Our Future, Food and Water Watch, Green Faith, the NAACP, Natural Resources Defense Council, SEIU Local 105, Sierra Club, and I forgot to say my name, so Colorado People's Alliance too. <laughs> um, so we have an incredible agenda for you all. Um, it's packed, we have so much. We were so excited to give you all kinds of information. Uh, we're going to hear from an amazing diverse panel that's gonna be discussing the issues that around climate justice. We're also going to have the opportunity to hear from two incredible keynote speakers to today. And then we have a, a super, super amazing workshops that the facilitators have been working really hard to put together um, for you all. So make sure to check the Facebook event. If you don't know which workshop you wanna go to, on the Facebook event, you will be able to find the description of all the workshops so you can make a decision. Um, and so now I want to introduce uh, our, our, our panel that's gonna come up to us so we can get started. So um, our Climate Jobs and Justice panel moderator, moderator is Megan Rast. She was born right here in Colorado and has a long history of working on different environmental issues and is currently working on increasing equity and opportunity for business owners uh, that are owned by people of color, by women, by veterans, and by people with disabilities. We're so excited to have this amazing panel here today. Um, so please help me and welcome them again. Hi. Oh. 
th thank you all for joining today. Um, I'm very excited to be here on behalf of Sierra Club Colorado. We are, we are an, the largest grassroots environmental organization that's been around for a long time. Therefore, we uh, have the history that I know we'll unpack and discuss today, but we also, I think, have a lot of opportunity. So I am, for logistics and housekeeping awareness, um, we, as part of the first question, the panelists are going to give you a really great overview and background of themselves, and then they know, and I hope we all treat this as a conversation. I know it'll be interesting um, for folks in the room to hear kind of the, the back and forth. So with that, I'm going to give the tiniest bit of overview and, and get us started. Um, our, I'll go from my, like, I'll go in this direction. There you go. <laughs> left to right, right to left. Um, so Hussein Almeki has served as a board member of the Colorado Interfaith Power and Light. And as a PhD student, he authors articles and poems and the book, A Face of a new face of Islam, excuse me, and he's fluent in Farsi and Arabic. Um, next to him is Dimitris Stev Stevish. Stevish, so close, I'm so, I apologize. Is a professor of politics at Colorado State University. His teaching and research is focused on labor environmentalism, labor politics, and social and environmental justice. And then next to him is Micah Parkin, the founder and executive director of 350 Colorado, and has served over 20 years uh, as a deep experience as a climate and clean energy advocate. Um, next to Micah is Makias Nagusi, a junior biology major at CU Denver and an in intern with Defend Our Future. And next to Makias is Dal Dalila Lopez, yeah, <laughs> um, an active COPA member, energized by COPA's commitment to resist harmful policies affecting her community. Um, and last but certainly not least is Josh Downey, um, the president of the Daria Denver Area Labor Federation. Um, so with, the f with that, I'll get to our first question. And we'll go in order just with this one. And then, like I said, hopefully everyone can be uh, conversational. So Pretty straightforward. Can you tell us why you are part of the climate justice movement? Um, in the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful, uh, thank you for giving me the invitation, the event, and uh, it's nice to be with all of these colleagues who are experts in this area. Um, my background, uh, I would, the way that I would answer that question is that I grew up, my mother was a science teacher and an activist, and um, she, brought home the idea of the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, in our home from a very young age. Uh, and the idea of justice is uh, what I believe is most important. Um, in Islam, we have a principal idea that the uh, foundation of all of the universe, which keeps it sound, is justice and equity. And it's the necessity for success of, human, of all of humanity. And so with that in mind, uh, justice is something that is intangible, and so environmental justice is a part of social justice, is a part of economic justice. They're all all uh, things that are you know intertwined, and so because of that, it's natural that if you are at all inclined to any part of justice at all, which is the natural inclination of a human being, that it seems that you would be also inclined to um, be. Uh, aware and active in terms of things that have to do with uh, environmental justice and particularly the, the very important trending topic of climate change. It's a pleasure to be here, it's very inspiring. I am in climate justice because I think it's part of social and environmental justice. This is uh, what I have dedicated my life to as a researcher and as a teacher, as a unionist and as an environmentalist. I think the pursuit of climate policy by itself or of social justice by itself are very, very important. But unless we combine them, we're going to get a very partial picture, a very partial vision of the future. It doesn't make sense to me to have green jobs or to have a renewable energy policy if workers cannot unionize, cannot defend their rights. And the same thing applies to communities. It doesn't make sense to me to move into a climate policy if that means that we side turbines or uh, recycle uh, or dump, I should say, solar panels in neighborhoods and create the same kinds of injustices like the fossil fuel economy has done. I'm part of the climate justice movement because as a mother and as a person, I just feel a really deep sense of responsibility 
to leave the best possible future for our children, all of the future children, um, for even all of the species that are um, in threat of becoming extinct because of the climate crisis. Um, I moved here from New Orleans 11 years ago, and uh, two years after Hurricane Katrina, and you know, looking for a safer place, and, um, and sadly we were on evacuation notice again within two years because of what was at that time the worst wildfire in Colorado's history, which has been surpassed by even four worse wildfires since, and then of course there were the horrible floods, in 2013, and it's just, it became ever so clear that there is no place that's safe from climate change, and we're all being impacted wherever we live, and sadly, those with the least among us are, uh, tend to be the, the people who are suffering the worst, not only because it's harder for them, like in Katrina, to escape from the crises, but they're all too often on the front lines of um, dealing with the extraction and pollution as well, and, um, Climate change is already having really serious effects on Colorado, as I'm sure we all know, from, you know, from the pine beetle devastation to the fires and floods and, um, you know, impacts on our tourism, agriculture. And we know that every year we wait to make the transition, the worse our children and future generations are going to have to suffer. And so we're, um, we started, that's why I and several others founded 350 Colorado. We're a climate movement organization with grassroots teams around the state and why I'm committed to working closely with allies to ensure the a just and equitable transition that prioritizes frontline and marginalized communities, workers, and youth happens with the speed that the climate crisis demands. Um, I don't know, my, oh, that happens uh, with the speed, I was saying, that the climate crisis demands. So what got me into the climate movement is, uh, first of all, the loss of biodiversity on planet Earth as a result of climate change. The rate of extinction right now on planet Earth is on par with the five mass extinctions in Earth's history. And that's frightening because our species is not separate from all other life on planet Earth. And we are very much dependent on that. Um, second, young people have a lot in stake uh, on this issue. Uh, it's not just about, you know, protecting beetles and protecting, you know, biodiversity. It's also our economy. Our economy is based on trading natural resources. So if we put those um, in, you know, in jeopardy, then young people have a lot to lose. And third, like the other panelists have, have mentioned, uh, minorities and communities uh, that are underrepresented on this issue are often the ones that have the that see the biggest effects they're on the front lines for experiencing pollution for all of the you know mining and and you know uh, extraction operations are always near low-income communities and that's what got me excited about um, fighting for climate justice hello what got me involved, interested in uh, uh, climate justice is just drinking water, opening the faucet. Uh, I've been involved for a long time, first with uh, immigrant rights work and now in climate justice work. And I got involved in the climate justice because I know that my family, friends, they all have to buy the water, even to cook. And just, it's, it's just not fair. And uh, regardless of where they live, people should have access to clean drinking water. Another reason is I'm very interested in the quality of air we breathe. Corporations are polluting our communities. They're polluting the areas where communities of color live, and we need to put a stop to it. Climate is all around us in our daily lives, from the moment we wake up and everything we do in between, including what we touch and use for work. This reminds me of the field workers I myself come from a family that's been working in the fields for many years. We saw the dangerous pesticides they use. I have used them myself. And I saw how many children, sons and daughters of field workers 
are born with brain damage or other problems. And um, what keeps me going is that we are not even close to achieving a healthy living environment in my community. We continue to be uh, affected by climate change in corporations that are more about profiting than about people in our planet. So I am fighting with COPA to put people in our planet first. I second all of that. Uh, good morning, sisters and brothers, friends. My name is Josh Downey. I'm the president of the Denver Area Labor Federation, and we represent um, 114 local unions in the Denver metro area, 90,000 workers. Um, and many of those workers work in the fossil fuel industry. They haul coal on trains. They work for XL Energy. Um, and, and I'm here, um, and, and we are a part of the climate justice movement for two reasons. First, the short answer. The science is real. You can't walk out your door or look out your window. You can't turn on your TV without seeing environmental degradation. 120,000 acres of Colorado burning this year. You know, half of California up in flames. The polar ice caps melting. So that's the easy answer. But here's the hard answer. Um, Frontline workers, those that work in, in fossil fuels, oil and gas industry, the coal industry, for example, have been left out of this conversation for far too long. And it's time that those workers had a voice at the table because changing our energy infrastructure, changing how we, we fuel, um, fuel our globe will affect those workers and they need a voice. Because as the sister just said, mentioned, corporations are winning. We think nothing, we don't bat an eye when, when our government subsidizes Exxon, Shell, or Mobile to the tune of $10 billion. We don't bat an eye when our government here in Colorado, our city government, gives $27 million for a corporation to come create jobs. And yet, when it comes to frontline workers who will lose their good paying jobs that provide health care and provide benefits and retirement security, we say, I'm sorry, we're gonna throw you to the wolves. And that shouldn't be okay for us. That shouldn't be acceptable. Yeah, let's give a round of applause for everyone. I, um, such an amazing uh, amount of experience. And so we've learned the powerful reasons why you all are part of the movement, but interested to know, you know, what keeps you as part of the movement in particular, because it can be a long journey and obviously there are challenges. So what keeps you as part of the movement? Popcorn. <laughs> Just seeing the, like, the first speaker in her prayer said, just seeing every day the damage that we are doing, that corporations are doing, big businesses, businesses, and it's, it's just sad. It's just sad, and, and it puts uh, people's lives in danger. And it seems like they only care about money, not people. I would just say a deep sense of responsibility again just you know future generations are counting on us we have to there's no choice and also just all the wonderful people who are part of the movement keep me going yeah I would just I would add to that that I mean we are in a way um, living in an exciting time you know one of the um, looking at the glass half full aspects of a lot of negative you know uh, political tension and things that are happening is that sometimes that's the wake up call that's necessary. And that's what gets people, you know, really um, encouraged, it gets the fire burning under them to do something. And we're seeing across the board, a lot of people who are opening their mouths, who are raising awareness, who are saying things, who are coming to events like this. So, I mean, I think it's an exciting time. That's something to, to uh, be mindful of right now. I think that one has to make a choice in life and decide who they are with and who they are against. And I have chosen to be with this group. It's more fun. <laughs> it's more innovative. It doesn't forget. It doesn't think only about itself. And in particular, in a place like this, in a process like this, the climate justice, jobs and justice, that's trying to bring together a variety of different stakeholders 
to give voice to groups that are, as Josh said, ha are at the front line, they need to be given voice. That is what I think uh, makes this a meaningful participation. So it's a life choice for me. What keeps me around is seeing all of the impact we can make, um, especially with uh, working with Defend Our Future. We go out, we talk to people, and this can actually make a difference. I mean, you, like all of the panelists have mentioned, corporations have a lot of influence on our politics, but we, there's a lot more of us than there are you know, Fortune 500 companies. So if we can get together and organize and talk to people and get them um, excited about climate change, get communities who are traditionally you know, not active on this issue to participate, then we really can make a difference. And yeah, that keeps me going. <laughs> I'm in it for the fight. Um, you know, I think that um, we can have a transition, an en energy transition, or we can have a just and equitable energy transition. And I, for one, am in it for that just and equitable transition. You see, we could build um, wind energy and solar, solar plants, solar farms, and we could continue to pay those workers bottom dollar wages, we could let the corporations continue to divide us and in turn reduce everybody's standard of living. We, we will do right by the environment but wrong by, by workers across the country. Or we can do this right. We can say that we're going to use this transition, we're going to use this opportunity to say, you know what, we're sick of this broken economy. We're sick of corporations telling us that it's okay that we're making $12 an hour. We would be happy for $15 an hour when we say, you know what, we have good jobs right now. There are workers out there making $25, $35, $45 dollars an hour. They have retirement security, they have pensions, they have health care. But there are folks that say, you shouldn't have that, and they pit us against one another. And they say, you know what, because that worker has it, um, you should run them out of town. You should be happy with what you get. Um, but we can make a just and equitable transition. We can say, just because we've done it wrong in the past doesn't mean we're going to do it wrong in the future. Instead, we work together as a team and say, God damn it, we're going to create an economy that works for everyone and not just the wealthy few. I agreed. <laughs> I, I second all of that. Um, so I think I, one of the things that's really important to acknowledge is that there are barriers, right? And I think we've touched on some of them, but it's important for us as part of this panel to really go in depth. So I wanna hear, you know, we all wanna hear from each of you, what do you think is the biggest obstacle in achieving a just and equitable transition to 100%? I'll start this time if that's all right. That's it. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about corporations. The, the corporate narrative is winning out right now. Um, the, the fact is that, that we are pitting each other against one another when it comes to this fight. If someone's making $20 and I'm only making $15, um, it's a battle with that worker. Never mind that the CEO is making 321 times what the average worker is making. Um, and so part of what I'm excited about with, with this movement is everyone is pointing their finger at the right enemy. We're saying, you know, this broken economy is not working. But one of the biggest barriers is we need to get over and we need to bust through that corporate narrative that says that, um, well, I'll, I'll illustrate it with an example. I work with a lot of, uh, of our political friends, folks that we consider political friends. And one of them had, had told me, Josh, look, we're going to create good green jobs, and you're going to be making, the workers are going to be making $20 an hour. And I said, Representative, will they be unionized? Representative, will they have health care? Will they have pension? And then, Representative, what do I tell the worker who is making $45 as a plant operator um, at, at, at Comanche? You know, we can't settle for the peanuts that the corporations are going to give us, and we have to be united in that. So that's the biggest obstacle for me. I agree. And uh, it just, it is, it is greed. It is greed and power in the hands of people that don't care, except for their own interests. And uh, it is true, it is true. You, you cannot argue with a computer about a price, but you do argue with a person that comes into your house to do a service or you know or when when it's uh, time to pay them it is totally true uh, we should appreciate human service more than uh, a corporation 
<clears throat> and uh, it seems like when we mention this word to many elected officials, they care more about the re-election than taking a stance for, for what is right. And we know that corporations care more about their profit than our communities. We are going to have to overcome a lot, but I'm sure that by working together, we will be able to accomplish our goals. There were some other topics on, yeah, the industry. And I, it is very possible to say that a major obstacle is the fossil fuel industry and its supporters and the corporations. But as Josh said and others have said, that doesn't mean that we forget the people who have for so many generations helped us survive and exist. But I think we also need to pay attention to the renewable industry. Because if the fossil industry keeps us from having climate policy, the renewable industry is not particularly kind towards a just green transition. Many of them, all they want to do is to produce green products with non-unionized jobs in communities that are vulnerable to them. So we are faced with a major dilemma and I think we are moving in the right direction. Do we want to be like Texas, produce the most renewable energy in the country but devastate the environment? Or do we want to move in a direction, let's say Washington State, and work for a just green transition together? I would definitely echo that. I think a lot of um, the, the major obstacles that we're seeing are, is, it's really three prongs in my mind. It's the, a very, very wealthy and powerful fossil fuel industry that wants to continue the status quo despite the fact that it's ruining our one and only planet. And um, it's also the financial investors who are making a lot of these destructive projects possible who are propping up a failing fracking industry that, for example, that doesn't, hasn't uh, been functioned in the, in the black in a very long time. Most of those companies function in the red and they're only propped up by those financial investors and, who pawn off these, uh, these loans to, um, these high risk loans to pension funds, for example. And, and then thirdly, it's the power that they are wielding on our government um, through donations, campaign donations, through lobbying, and which has sadly turned, I think, our democracy largely into a corporatocracy or a plutocracy. And I think it's going to take an extremely powerful movement of people to stand up against that. And uh, thankfully, we, I think we have that. It's growing, it's building. I'd echo what Micah said about um, you know, lobbying and the revolving door of politics. We have uh, representatives that are really looking forward to their next job, and if they can score, you know, some bonus points by, you know, shoving through legislation that doesn't represent us, but maybe represents a few of their donors, then that definitely helps them score their next lobbying gig. I think that's definitely the biggest, um, that's the biggest obstacle we face right now. Um, you know, right now, uh, the administration, the Trump administration, is trying to roll back the clean power plant, um, the clean car standards, and these are things that are very popular amongst, you know, if you were to poll Americans, they would say, you know, we support that, we want cleaner cars, um, we want, we don't want a lot of pollutants in communities that have power plants, but of course, you know, their donors don't necessarily agree. Yeah, and uh, just to kind of go back to um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier about that connection that several people touched on, uh, that connection with social justice. I think that that's one of the most overlooked aspects of uh, this movement as a whole. I think what happens is a lot of times, uh, whether from individuals or organizations, there becomes this tunnel vision of focusing on the important and very, very um, uh, 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 a relevant issue of climate change, but ignoring how that connects to so many people's lives. So if I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm from West Philadelphia, born and raised, and so literally, <laughs> that's my neighborhood. And so I know what it's like to, you know, um, if you're concerned about living tomorrow, if you're concerned about being killed by 
you know, uh, police injustice or, uh, or something like that. If you're concerned about your economic stability, how can you bring to someone, you know, the conversation about the big picture of the climate and the water? They're not concerned about what's going to happen in 50 years because they're concerned about today and tomorrow. So that relevant message of how do you connect, how do you connect the issues of social justice is as important for this movement, and it's important that it's across the board, that uh, uh, organizations that are active in climate change matters do not ignore these important relevant issues and try to solely focus on one aspect. It, it, would, it's, it will never be successful, truly. I mean, I can't tell someone who is struggling with these other aspects to look at the big picture when they may be you know, dying in the moment. So this is uh, what I think, I mean, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, touch on this, the big trending topic of, uh, um, in social media with Nike and Colin Kaepernick and uh, you know, the, the slogan of uh, believe in something uh, uh, even if you have to sacrifice everything. And um, I would say that from a big picture in terms of environmental change, we will sacrifice everything. You know, literally everything will be sacrificed even if you don't believe in something. So it's a matter that has to come to be brought to the table and be made relevant. The matter of jobs and economy is especially important in this regard because now you're, you're speaking to a language of, some, of, of people at the bottom who understand that I need to survive and this is something that's relevant for me. How do you make that tangible? I think that's the uh, important question for us right now. Um, fantastic sort of deep understanding on the barriers that we're facing and I, I don't want us to end on that note. So the good news is uh, after we've gone deep into the barriers, uh, we also want to explore what you're hopeful about, right? So what is working in terms of this movement, especially considering the barriers that you all just identified? I'll start. Um, we're here. I think this, this gives me hope right now. Um, I started this by mentioning that all too often times frontline workers, labor wasn't at the table. We're there now in part because we're working with coalition and partners that say, yes, frontline workers have to be at the table and be a part of this work. Um, and that, that's what gives me hope because we can't solve this. We can't overcome corporate interest, corporate power, corporate dollars if we're not collaborating and working together. So that gives me hope. I am very hopeful about the power that we can all wield when we stand together. And I think a very exciting example of that was the, the recent um, success of the Colorado Rising um, Ballot Initiative for Safer Setbacks from Fracking. <laughs> that, that, was a, um, that was a really good example of how a heck of a lot of people standing together and working really hard can have a success even under um, the really difficult odds and a very wealthy and powerful and unscrupulous industry that's willing to do all kinds of <laughs> incredible things to try and stop it and still succeeded. Um, and I also am really hopeful about our young people and just, you know, how much they care and how knowledgeable so many of our young people are about these issues and how dedicated they are to creating a better world. It gives me a lot of hope. I want to reflect what and echo what I just heard. I think that being together is very, very important. Collaborating is very important. But I think we have to go beyond collaboration. I think we have to internalize each other's values. We have to become one. Collaborating every so often is not enough because the powers that be have permanent power, long-term power. We cannot just confront them every so often. But the more we talk to each other, the more we internalize each other's values, the more we form a comprehensive, long-term political agenda, the more we will realize that it is the same people who violate both social justice and environmental justice. And they have been doing that for a long, long time. I think that, um, and it's also been somewhat touched on as the uh, the idea of the grassroots initiatives and the, uh, the power of the people. 
you know, uh, to, to quote Tribe Called Quest, we don't believe you because we're the people, right? We the people do have a voice. We the people really do have an ability to make a difference. And I think sometimes that becomes overlooked because of the systems in place and because of the, uh, uh, the ruling class, the 1%, the corporations. Uh, I think we overlook that. And a lot of what happens is the people in the middle and the majority of people, the people who have, who if they were together in one voice could make change, I think that gets overlooked sometimes. But you are seeing uh, um, events like this, you are seeing grassroots initiatives, you are seeing young people become more aware. And I think that as long as there's an aspect of educating and making people aware, then that's, uh, that's something hopeful to look for, forward to in the future. I'd echo what everybody else said, grassroots movements, we know that talking to people works. When we go out um, and canvas, we know that that is much more effective than TV ads or ads on social media. So that's really what's working and that's what gets me passionate about the work we do because we go out and we make people energized. Um, we're, what's also working is changing the narrative. I think in the past it used to be, oh, you know, renewable energy is so expensive or you know, protecting our environment is so expensive. But what we're doing now is what's expensive. We're subsidizing oil companies, we're, we're hurting workers just to you know, profit the very few at the top. And if we get together and really you know, make sure that we make our voices heard as one and unite on this issue, then I think we can really succeed. I think what is working is keeping the pressure and continuing to fight. And today is a big first step for that. But we have to make sure that we don't stop. We have to make sure that we continue to get involved, that we advocate for this change, and that we take a risk and hear someone else's perspective. That you hear about what, why this is so important for communities of color and why we need to ensure a good transition for our workers. So it's us here that internally, and it's also outside, we need to keep making noise, making people empowered and comfortable. We need to keep having these meetings. We need to plan. And I'm hoping that we can reinstate what's damaged and that this movement turns into a snowball that gets so big that's going to provoke an avalanche that no one can stop. <laughs> we need a climate revolution that even the most oblivious can understand. Yes. Um, please give the panelists a very loud round of applause. This was a fantastic discussion. Um, and yeah. <laughs> I'm just so grateful to have been your moderator and, and have been taking her through this experience. We are extremely on time. So with that, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna exit and hand it back over. So thank you all so much. Thank you. That was so powerful. So let's just give it up one more time to our amazing panel. Um, I think sometimes you go to a lot of different conferences, right? And you hear panels and you're like, yeah, that was good. But this one, like freaking, whoa, y'all, like that was powerful and inspiring, right? Um, hopefully I'm not alone in that. I think that was pretty good. Um, so, um, what we have going on today and what you just saw with this panel is completely unprecedented. And I want to mention that because that is so powerful. Never in Colorado before have we seen labor, faith, green, uh, community, youth organizations coming together to work on figuring out how do we actually fight for climate justice in our state, right? And this panel right here reflects, right, like the big step that we've taken together to actually fight for that and move this forward. So that, that's, that's pretty incredible. And, and you all are part of it now, right? Um, so 
our next speaker is coming all the way from Canada. And uh, she's been doing this work, right? She embodies what we're trying to move forward uh, today here, right? Bringing different sectors to work on climate issues while ensuring that frontline workers are not left behind. So Siobhan Bypond is a proud member of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees Local 210. She is currently on her third term as Secretary Treasurer of the Alberta Federation of Labor and prior to that, she served as the president of Local 210. Like, incredible resume there. Uh, Bipond is a tireless advocate on occupational health and safety, women's equality, and on ensuring the workers' voices are represented at all levels. Bipond has been leading some incredible work in Canada from which we can all learn about so much. So please join me in welcoming Siobhan Bipond. Thank you so much. It's um, quite a pleasure to um, be here and uh, quite an honor. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on traditional lands of the um, Arapoa tribe and home to the peoples of the Indigenous nations native to Colorado, which include the Apache, the Comanche, Sh Shoshona, and Ute. And it is in that light that we are here gathered together to try and make sure that we are taking this land and moving forward responsibly. The world is changing, and I don't need to tell you that. You know that's why you're here, um, but we need to acknowledge it and also find our place within that. The world is changing in so many different ways, and everybody here has, uh, will live the causes of that. We will live the damage that it does, but we also need to live what our responsibility was, is within that. There are economical reasons, there are political reasons, as well as environmental reasons of why we need to move forward on environmental change. I come from Canada and fortunately the numbers of people who believe in climate change are significantly different than this country. And so, but I know where I am, I just heard that panel and everybody speaking was inspiring and everything they were saying, so I know I'm in the right place so I can skip all of that part. So let's just move on to what our experience has been in, in Alberta, where I live, um, just, well, not just north, but north of here, um, and, and, and uh, as well as what's happening across Canada. In Canada, currently, we are in the process of, of shutting down all of our coal-generated um, electricity, um, and that will, um, there you go. <laughs> Um, and so, in, across Canada, it needs to be shut down. Um, in Alberta, it needs to actually get to zero emissions by 2030. And we are in process of doing that. There's a misnomer that happens, um, just to give some context, Alberta is traditionally one of the most conservative um, provinces uh, within Canada. Um, and we previously had a, quite a conservative government, though you've set a new standard. Um, but. <laughs> But it's been 10 or 15 years of these policies being introduced. So our previous conservative federal government, um, in Alberta we have um, 18 um, generators that are coal-fired and uh, they had introduced policy, um, not a plan, um, policy that meant that 12 of those had to shut down by 2030. Recently in Alberta in 2015, after 44 years of having the same conservative government, we elected a worker-friendly, labor-friendly, people-friendly government, and they have since come, yeah, that is worth it. <laughs> and they have come out with a climate leadership plan, and in that plan, that means that the remaining six um, generators will also be shut down by 2030. That has a huge impact. Yes, it has positive environmental impacts. There is no doubt of that. But it also has huge economic impacts that need to be dealt with, they need to be discussed, and they need to be ensured that that's part of it. And that's why I make, I make it very clear that the conservative federal government didn't have a plan. They just said they were gonna, they were gonna, they had to stop. That was it. There was no money, there was no plans, there was no discussion. So through this climate leadership plan, what we have done in Alberta is that we um, are looking at the long term, yes, but also what the short term means. And so, in 2015, 50% of the power we generated in Alberta came from coal fire. We have one of the highest um, percentages of coal fire, partly because of where we are, and just partly because economically that's what has made sense in our province. 
So this climate leadership plan includes a carbon tax, and that carbon tax means that um, like we all pay it, but anybody who makes, um, I think it's less than 80,000, don't quote me on the number, sorry, but the majority of working people get that money back um, because it's not, it's kind of a, you know, a moving of money. And so that those who can afford it are paying for this change. And that change has lots of, lots of programs and some of them are small and some of them are big. Some of the smaller ones is right now that if you phone, sign up for the program, they come to your house, they change all your bulbs to LEDs, they change your thermostat, they change um, your power bars, your water, just to try and make sure that every household is maybe reducing their power to a certain point. And that's a free program for everybody because it's paid through this program. Then we talk about big changes, so getting rid of the coal industry, and that's where we are concerned, um, and we were concerned. We're, we're a little bit more optimistic now. Just how many here feel like they have a working understanding of what the phrase just transition means? Okay, there's no judgment from here. When we started this process, it was almost disappointing because when we knew the climate leadership came out, our president, Gil McGowan, he started what we call the Coal Transition Coalition. Try saying that five times fast. Um, and that was made up of all of the unions who had workers in the industry. Um, so it was a lot of our building trades, um, our electrical workers, our utility workers, um, to get them to the table to go, what are we going to do to make sure that our voices are heard through this process? At the same time, the government was consulting with indigenous groups, environmental groups, companies, um, communities at all levels um, to ensure that whatever their plan was, was one, had to be bought into because that's politics, but also to ensure that nobody was getting left out of the conversation. And so when we met at the table, we clearly said we want just transition and how we start every project is then we did research. And it was amazing to us how there are some examples across the world of where this sort of worked, but there wasn't like a glowing example of where it all worked. Because the reality is, is that these changes have been happening and it has been sometimes on the, work, on the backs of workers. And what I mean by that is, what we mean by just transition is that the world is changing because of what corporations, and we heard like because of greed or because of politics, this is all changing. And we all have a responsibility to do it. But it is not the few hundred workers at the High Vale mine who need to pay the entire burden of this change. And so we need to have justice. So this just transition means that we need to all look at it and make sure that these workers who have not profited off of this industry, they have made a living, been able to support their families, have supported communities, and now we say, you don't deserve that and you are the ones who have to pay that price. So this is why Just Transition is so important. This is really was the priority of the Coal Coalition. Now, I know you all probably know a worker that you've talked to who is resistant to this change, but I hope that you have empathy to understand that what you're asking that person is to now give up their job, give up their ability to support their family, and give up what maybe they identify as, because somehow them giving their labor for hopefully a reasonable wage was not a, is, is too much. And so now we're saying, no, now you can't have that and we don't respect that. So I think we need to show some empathy to that. And then we also need to show some leadership in the labor movement and say, we need to know what the world is and the way we want to see it. And now let's, how do we get there? And so that's why I'm here is to talk because we've had some successes in Alberta about how this coal transition um, is happening. And as you all know, as activists, the work is never done. There's always more to be had. But that right now, we are very happy with how far we've come. And so this process about transition, we wanted to talk about a few different things with our government. Now, the reason why politics and you probably know this is so important, but we didn't start the conversation trying to fight in terms of why a worker's at the table. We started with being at the table, being a part of the process, and then being actually able to talk about the changes that need to be taken into consideration. One of the, pro the so the program helped out, it helped out the, you know, the owners of these plants and the investors so that they were gonna get money about their stranded assets. And so one of the town halls that we had in one of the communities, one of the workers stood up and he's like, what about my stranded assets? He said, I bought a house in this town. This is a coal town. This town is gonna to fold and my house is gonna be worth nothing. 
And so we listened because that is a very important point. Stranded assets isn't owned by rich corporations. Stranded assets is about investing whatever it is. Whether you buy a house or even you invest because your kids are out of school, you have to be compensated for that in some way when we look at this. The other, so our demands were, I'm saying demands, that's very harsh. Our asks, we were very nice about it. We're Canadian. <laughs> um, was to provide good jobs. We needed to replace family sustaining union jobs with family sustaining union jobs. This isn't to put, yes, absolutely. The towns that are heavily affected by this, I'm sure it's the same here in Colorado, you drive around, right? We got like, you got the coal town, there's the train town, there's like forestry town, like these towns are sustained by usually one big industry. And so they have a lot of a struggle in terms of what they're going to do and what they're going to identify. But telling everybody at the coal mine that they can start working in retail or a low paid industry, one is there's respect in that, but it's not equivalent because we, we haven't got those wages to a decent, so these are not replaceable. This is about replacing good jobs with good jobs. And also keeping in mind um, what we had as our second is that it has to be, there has to be education, there has to be training, um, and there needs to be counseling to help people work through what that means. We also, um, we needed financial support. This couldn't be a piece of paper saying this all sounds good and it's magically going to happen. It needed real money, real investment, and also deliverables that were going to be shown over time. We also wanted to see support for communities. And as a worker organization, um, obviously by supporting workers, you're supporting the communities. That's what communities are. But the people at our table were very concerned because so many of them were telling us stories about if we don't live in our town, who's going to the local restaurant? If we don't live in our town, then the, the school will not be able to, like majority of those kids are you know, kids of coal workers or related industries. And so they were very concerned that we had to make sure that there was good programming and good investment to make sure that these towns were able to survive so that they also had a just transition. We also wanted a tailored plan. It couldn't be just, again, that empty words. It needed to be tailored. It needed to actually be specific to communities, specific to the type of worker, and make sure that everybody came out ahead. And then our last was that in order for a just transition to be successful, both government and the employers had to be reasonably involved, but also buy into it and take on responsibility because we couldn't do this alone. I am very happy to say that the government delivered on every single one of those. Um, and yeah, the interest for me, politics, is governments don't give you things. They don't just hand them out. They give them if they're demanded or if they think they can win an election on it. And so, again, like I said, we have a great government. We were already halfway through the conversation, which was awesome. But what ended up happening is that we had income support to reemployment. Um, totaling 75% of previous earnings for 45 weeks to assist people. Um, we, had pension, we have pension bridging um, because many of these workers, especially if you're within 5, 10, 15 years, are you really finding another career? But you have a pension, but then you'll lose your pension because now you have to draw on it. There's so many aspects of that. So then this was part of the program, which, which was pension bridging. There's tuition vouchers for up to $12,000, and this is something that was extremely important because we want to make sure that, again, this isn't about downskilling. If someone wants to take that $12,000 and go become, I don't know, a labor lawyer, then they should be allowed to do that. This isn't about judging people and saying you have to only be here in society. No, if we're saying that you need to continue on in a job, they get to choose what that is, and education vouchers happen. There's a workforce adjustment service, there's on-site counseling um, for people, and we haven't stopped making sure that this is delivering, and that means listening and talking to workers. So where that leaves us is that we all have a role to play. We had success in Alberta, but it's not ending there. There's going to be sunset industries everywhere because of this transition that we need to start taking, and this needs to be just. Because there cannot be any environmental justice if we don't have economic justice and we don't have worker justice. Those go hand in hand. So we have to listen to those who are affected. We have to ensure that they understand that the, what their role is and that we were listening and that they can be active in it. 
Any plan that is somebody from the top telling us what we're dealing with the workers is not good enough. Workers at the table, green at the table, indigenous people at the table, people of lower income are at the table. This is a decision making and it's extremely important. And we need elective representatives who will listen and we need elective representatives who will show leadership. And so there's a lot of work to do on that file, but it is real. And then once we get those elected officials, then we demand more and we push them because then they will give what we are going to need. So when we, we need to organize and we need to make room for people. And so where I come from in Alberta is Treaty 6 lands. We are all treaty people and at the Federation of Labor, we practice um, what is called Tatawa, which is a Cree word that means welcome. And to me, it speaks so true to what we're doing here. It doesn't just mean welcome. Tatawa means welcome, there is room for you. The only way we are going to have a just transition is if we make room for everybody who is affected by this and we share the burden of it, but we will share the rewards when we know that we are stewards of this land the way we should be. Thank you. Are you inspired? Yeah? That was so good. Thank you so much, Siobhan, for coming and for all the work that you're doing and inspiring us so we can keep going. So are you ready for the workshops? Yeah? <laughs> okay, so we have an incredible group of folks that are going to be facilitating the workshops. They've been working really hard to put them together um, and they're all waiting for you in their rooms. So we're gonna start making that transition. If you know which workshop you're going and which room it is on, you should just grab your stuff and start heading over there, but I'm gonna list them. So welcome back, how was it? Really? Um, I was snooping around and they all look super, super incredible with like deep conversations, that's so cool. So we're almost done with the day. Make sure to follow up with the folks that presented and that you really find a way to plug in with the different groups that are here. Because like we've been saying all day, right? It's gonna take all of us to really like move this work forward in Colorado. And now you get to be part of it and really help us shape it and move it forward. So I'm really, really honored to introduce our next speaker um, today and our closing keynote speaker for the day because um, this guy represents um, the city that in some ways welcomed me when I moved to this country from Mexico when I was 12 years old. My parents still uh, call Thornton, Colorado their home. Uh, Representative Joe Salazar has served in the Colorado House of Representatives since 2013. Um, he's an attorney that focuses on civil rights, constitutional law, and employment law. He's a Colorado native and has been a champion and fierce fighter for all of our issues, and he continues to be committed to that fight. Uh, so please help, uh, join me in welcoming Representative Joe Salazar. What's up, people? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this in my hand because someone said, I want you to talk about an action that's taking place on September 21st of 27 called Activate Colorado from 9, from 9, I don't know, is it 9 to 8 p.m.? 9 in the morning to 8 p.m.? Woo, that's a long day at JUC. So, so remember that. I'm going to say it again um, at the end of my speech. We want to be supportive of each other as we move forward and as we build on community. It is good to be here with you today. Yes. Thank you, Lizette. Thank you, uh, Colorado People's uh, Alliance and Action for helping me uh, be here with you today. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak with you. I just drove down from Greeley, Colorado, just moments ago. And I was scared because I was going to be late because I don't, like, I don't like a mad Lizeth. How many of you know Lizeth? <laughs> so I was booking it down here, but as I was driving down, I don't live in Greeley, I had another action to do up in Greeley, 
as I was driving down, I was paying attention to all of the oil and gas operations that are happening up and down Highway 85. I, you could literally throw a stone from one operation to the next, to the next, to the next, all the way to Greeley, Colorado. And as I was sitting there taking that drive, I remembered back to the time when I was a civil rights investigator for the state of Colorado, and I was based in Greeley. And I can remember that drive from 96 to 98, where you wouldn't see a fracking rig for miles and miles. You wouldn't see oil tanks and storage tanks dotting alongside the highway. You wouldn't see any of those things. Instead, what you would see, and particularly from March all the way up until October, is you would see the farmers and the ranchers preparing for the growing season and for the harvest season. And that was my favorite drive, my favorite drive ever going to Greeley, Colorado. Every day, I would take that drive and watch what the farmers and ranchers were doing to provide foods for us. And so it stands in stark contrast right now that as I'm driving up there, I saw less in the way of farming and ranching and more in terms of oil and gas production. And I know that these activities have increased the amount of pollution that we are experiencing in the state. In fact, the one industry that is causing the most pollution in our state. And I started thinking too about how this one industry is gobbling up all the water that we need to sustain life in this state. From our farms and our ranches and even to ourselves. And how all of this water resource that they're gobbling up can't be returned back to its natural cycle. That it is so fouled that they have to pump it deep into the earth. And how when they do these injections, how these injections cause the earthquakes that we are now starting to feel in Colorado. Very much similar to what we've seen in Oklahoma. And how as a result of earthquakes, we see that there are now, there, there's now property that are, that's being damaged because of it. And in Oklahoma, we have seen how uh, people have been injured as a result of these earthquakes. But as though, as though that's not enough, we also see that this industry doesn't take care of the wells that they did pump. And we have what are called orphan wells. And how it wasn't just too long ago, just a few months back, while I was in session on the floor of the House of Representatives, that an orphan well was belching thousands of gallons of oil onto a state highway in Berthoud, Colorado. And as though that's not enough, that we have had explosion after explosion after explosion throughout the state of Colorado because of this one industry. An industry, as we are now learning from their stakeholders as well as their employees, their whistleblowing employees, how this industry is forsaking the safety and the health and the welfare of their employees and of people and of the environment for profits. This isn't anything that I'm making up. This is something that you could Google about in the news right now, and you would find article after article supporting what I am saying to you. And as I was driving, and I, and I went up to go support a friend of mine who's running for an office up there, as I was driving, I thought to myself, my God, my God, we are in dire need of heroes. We are in dire need of those heroes, those elected officials, those community heroes who are rising up against this one industry that is affecting everything else in the state of Colorado. I mean, let's think about it. Let's think about it just for a second. The industry likes to say that they, that they employ 
or that people are employed as a result of the industry and the amount of, the number is 328,000 Coloradans. That's not really the number. The number is around 54,000 Coloradans, right? But when we take a look at the outdoor industry, outdoor recreation, and the tourism industry that employs hundreds of thousands of Coloradans in this state, when we take a look at the farming and ranching industry that employs hundreds of thousands of employees in this state, when we take a look at our, uh, our, our service industry, particularly in our mountain towns, that employ tens of thousands of people across this state, it is this one industry that seems to take the ear of the elected officials at the state capitol, in our local governments, and with our county offices. Why is that? Hmm. What? Money? I wondered if you Googled the amount of donations that the oil and gas industry has given over a period of four years, how much that would amount to? Anybody know? It was $80 million in Colorado alone over a four-year period. Imagine that. Imagine that we have debased ourselves so much as a society that we allow one industry to affect all others. That we allow one industry to infect all others like a virus, like a parasite, like a vampire, like the Nosferatu of 2018, like the Chupacabra of our time. <laughs> that they suck everything from us and make us ill. But yet no one has found the stake to put in the heart of this industry. And don't tell me that we can't. Do not tell me that when we were able to put people on the moon in a period of five years, that we cannot figure out how to do renewable energies and wean ourselves off of this fossil fuel industry. Do not tell me that we are not capable of doing such things. Our species has been defined by the tragic and the heroic. We have done some horrible things, but we've also done some mighty powerful things. Do not tell me that we cannot bring back that level of intelligence and creativity and good thinking for renewable energies. Yes, we can. Si sí se puede. Does it seem to you like I'm disturbed? I am. Because over the past six years, in my elected position, I have sought common ground with other elected officials to help us out with this. And I have done it for purpose. I am indigenous to this land. And I am Apache here. And I am also Spanish. My Spanish roots go back 400 some odd years. We are indigenous here. And I've always been raised with the philosophy that we are the caretakers of the earth. Because you tell me a time when Mother Earth hasn't provided for us. Can you think of that? Can you think of a time when our population went from 100 million worldwide to now nearly 8 billion worldwide that Mother Earth didn't provide for us? She is living and she is breathing. She is a living creature. And yet we take and we take and we take from her. We don't give anything back at all. We take from her and we watch this industry siphon life blood from her, felling our air, felling our water, felling our land, and harming our children. Because, my God, if you're not going to fight for Mother Earth, why wouldn't you fight for your children? 
we are seeing studies come out finally. Real strong studies from the University of Colorado and elsewhere showing that if you live within a range of 3,000 feet of a fracking operation, your risk for cancer goes up by double digits. We are seeing effects in my district of children suffering from asthma when they never had asthma before. Of skin irritations where they never had skin irritations before. And other ailments that they never had before. Because a fracking rig is not too far away from the back porch. Are our children not worth fighting for? How about our future generations? That's why I'm in this. I'm in this for my children and hopefully one day grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I don't know if I'm going to live long enough to see great-grandchildren, but it's possible. And I'm here to fight for seven generations. And that's why you're all here too, isn't it? You should give yourselves the applause because when I said I was looking for heroes, I found them here today. Give yourself applause. Now, I know someone's going to hold up a sign saying, Representative Salazar, you have five minutes. I got to tell you that these lights right here, I can't see anything. And with the reflection coming off my bald head, I certainly can't see anything. <laughs> Where are you at? There you are. Cool. <laughs> so how do we fight back? What makes us the hero is that we were born to be. I mean, because you do know that you were born for this moment, right? That absolutely everything that your ancestors have gone through, absolutely everything that has resulted in your DNA, absolutely everything that has resulted in your creation to live in the 21st century, to live and breathe in this auditorium in 2018 is because you were born to be here. You were born for this moment. And what does that mean, being born for this moment? It means that you were born to be the warriors that we need. You were born to be those heroes that we need to move forward, to fight against a mighty dragon. And it is. It is a mighty dragon that belches all sorts of things. But you have something even more powerful than that. You have the power of the human spirit and you have power of human knowledge. You have the ability to educate yourselves and to become an intellect in this area and to do one thing that no other country enjoys quite like we do. Although after this last election, maybe you were questioning it. It's the power to vote. It's the power to vote and the power to hold people accountable. Now, I was well respected at the state capitol. But I wasn't well liked. I'm just going to put that out there. And the reason why I wasn't well liked is because it wasn't my job to make friends at the state capitol. It was my job to hold people accountable. Just like community was holding me accountable for being a state representative. But that's your power, right? As, a, as an elected official, this badge right here, this badge, the, the influence of this badge is an illusion. And that's what elected officials need to understand, is that you're in the position not because of your sheer magnificence. <laughs> you are in the position because the people said you can be in that position. You are the power, the influence. Do I really have to stop? You are the power and the influence. You are the ones that get to vet the candidates before you vote for them. And you need to do it better. Because I've been at every single meet and greet that maybe some of you have been in. And I've listened to the questions and I've seen the politicians dodge. And you need to stop having politicians dodge you. You need to stop having politicians avoid your questions. You need to look at them in a group and stand with them and say, we will not vote for you until you answer our question. And you need to tell them, oh my God, we are so tired of electing cowards because we're looking for heroes. In closing, 
I need you to get out and vote. I need you to get out and vote and fight for our Mother Earth. I need you to get out and vote to fight for your children, your grandchildren, and seven generations from now. Because I tell you, seven generations from now, they're going to look back seven generations and say, what did they do for me? What did they do to protect my environment and the ability to breathe clean air and to drink clean water and to have clean food? What did those seven generations ago do for me? And I'll be damned if I am going to go into the spirit world not thinking that I never fought for them. Thank you very much. So I want to, that was amazing, right? Um, so I want to ask our coalition partners to come up, please. Um, Juan, Jessica, and Dennis, the mics are waiting for you. We, the following organizations. 350 Colorado. Clean Energy Action. Colorado People's Alliance. Colorado FFL-CIO. Conservation Colorado, Protegete. Denver Area Labor Federation. Food and Water Watch. Green Faith. NAACP. Natural Resource Defense Council. SEIU Local 105. And the Sierra Club are committed to collectively working to move Colorado to a just and equitable transition to a renewable energy economy that protects frontline workers, communities of color, and those most impacted by climate change and pollution. Our collective commitment began this year and continues for the rest of 2018 and into 2019. Thank you all so much. We wanted to make sure to read a commitment from us to continue the work and to invite you to join us as we really work together as a collective to move Colorado to a just and equitable transition. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, please make sure to go out there and talk to people about the work um, that's happening um, in their organizations to get involved. Fill out those pledge cards. We will be email, uh, mailing them back to you right before the election. Uh, like Joe said, right? It starts here, it's in the streets, but it's also in the voting, uh, voting booth. So we have to make sure that we move this work forward. Thank you so much. Uh, please stick around, talk to us and get involved. And we're looking forward to seeing you as we continue this fight. Thank you.